Hi, I'm Tony Rosato, and welcome to the Tony Rosato Show. This is my first episode. Uh, we're going to have uh, all sorts of actors and profiles from the entertainment industry in Canada from week to week, profiling people that are making a difference. And uh, the actor that we have today as our first guest is Nick Mancuso, who certainly has made a difference in this industry. He's one of the leading, greatest actors in North America and the world. Has an incredible resume. He's uh, here to talk to us a little bit today, and we're so happy to have him. Nick, how are you? Tony. Good to see you, buddy. Oh, what an intro. Wow. <laughs> Truly. A difference, my God. You're Italian. Were you born in Italy? No, I'm not Italian. As Sophia Loren said to Barbara Walters when, uh, when she, uh, Barbara Walters was interviewing her, and I worked with Sophia years ago, she said, as an Italian, how do you feel? And she goes, as an Italian, and finally Sophia Lauren said, I am not Italian. I am Neapolitan. Uh -huh. You know. And I'm not Italian. I'm a, I'm a Calabrian. A Calabrian. Calabrian. From Calabria, as you are. Right. And as you know, Calabria and Sicily, and from Naples down, was a nation. And the nation was called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. And the so-called unification, which was really an invasion of the South in the 1860s, a mass genocide, which is, by the way, something that I, I'm involved in an organization to try to bring this information out to the Italians, there's 30 million Southern Italians, right. 30 million of us around the world, was a direct consequence of, the, uh, of, of an invasion from the North, which destroyed the economy of the South. To this day, uh, the South was four times richer than the rest of uh, Italy combined. It was the third richest nation in Europe at the time, had the second largest merchant fleet. We had the first railroad in Italy. We had steel mills. It was an economy and it was a nation. And then what happened was, under the guise of this so-called unification, which was actually backed by money, British money, and it had to do with sulfur monopolies in Sicily, they destroyed the South. Mm -hmm. So, I don't want, you know, so it's funny because you say Italian, the word Italia comes from the South. Mm -hmm. It comes from uh, the Calabrian region, you know, right. the ancient Greek colonies. So I, I don't consider myself to be an Italian. I consider myself to be a Calabrian. Did and, the industry uh, consider, see you as being an Italian? Has the industry used you as an Italian? You know, interestingly enough, it hasn't. Um, I mean, most of my early years, of course, I played, uh, you know, I told you about the five stages of the actor's career, right? Stage number one, the ingenue, the lover. Stage number two, the hero. Stage number three, the villain. Stage number four, the loser. And stage number five, the monster. Now I'm in the monster phase. Um, I was brought in as the lover, basically. I was brought in as the Valentino figure. The leading uh, man. Yeah, opposite all the Hollywood starlets of the time. Right. You know, uh, the television. Uh, so I worked opposite absolutely every sort of beautiful uh, woman star from Catherine Deneuve. Well, Mr. you're a stupendous looking person. man. I mean, throughout your entire life. I, have the un I had the unfortunate Valentino thing happening, which can be very unfortunate. It certainly was for Valentino, by the way. Right. Um, I actually started writing, a, I've been writing a series of books, but one of the books that I'm writing is based on the sort of archetypes of early Hollywood, of which Valentino was, uh, you know, a Harlow, Valentino, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Senate, and all those guys were sort of established Hollywood, uh, the archetypes, and then extended all the way down to the, to the Costners and the, the Tom Cruises, but they're all reflections. Anyway, Valentino is someone that fascinated me. And what people don't know about Valentino besides the fact that he was Southern Italian, like us, um, and of, of French background, uh, like I was too as well on my mother's side, was that uh, Valentino was an immensely uh, spiritual guy. If you read his letters, the guy was, no, yeah, I mean, he's known sort of like he was into the esoterica of Hollywood at the time, but he was an incredibly uh, intuitive, spiritual soul, and he couldn't stand the studios. Mm. And in fact, got himself into a lot of trouble, as I couldn't either. I couldn't stand the, the whole, I can't stand the whole sort of system that's in place and has been in place from the moment I got into this business. You know, I mean, the, the guy that's out there now really kind of like, uh, you know, Mickey Rourke and all those guys. And, and even Brando, you know, moved all the way up to Tahiti to get away from, you know, the, from that whole thing. But, but Valentino actually took on the uh, studios, did not want to be, quote, a piece of meat. Uh, and, uh, and of course, this is the early years of America, there's a tremendous amount of racism. You know, and we've all seen the movie with uh, Nureyev, you know, playing him. You know, um, you know, pissed off the American, i.e. Scottish, English, 
Anglo reality of America, Germanic uh, mm -hmm. reality of America. And, uh, you know, and I uh, was accused of being homosexual and being, uh, you know, and, and you know, that, all that whole kind of layering upon the Italian spirit, right? Which really wasn't turned around until Frank Sinatra came around. Mm. You know, and Sinatra, I'm actually, I wrote a play about him uh, dealing with sort of like the real story. Sinatra really kind of kicked open the doors, too much so in some ways, uh, against the whole kind of racism. The American racism and Valentino uh, was actually a victim of it because what happened was he got fired, he uh, you know he uh, he he toured uh, you know, the United States uh, dancing the tango. The studios wouldn't hire him uh, anymore. Uh, he had enough in a sense to start his own studio, mm -hmm. um, and then finally I think the stress killed him because um, you know he died of a bleeding ulcer. Really? Yeah, died of a bleeding ulcer at uh, a young age. At a, at a relatively yeah pretty young age. He, he had gone to New York to meet his brother who had come in from Italy and he had gone through years of this kind of battle and, uh, and it finally killed him uh, in many ways. Sinatra was the answer to that in some ways. Sinatra came along and said enough, kicked open the door and then in a sense out of that came the, uh, you know, from the Brian De Palmas, Marty Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, Robert De Niro, Al Pacino and on it goes, right? But really until Sinatra really kind of D uh, did that in a sense, mm -hmm. you know. There was Frank Capra certainly, but every every italic figure before that was the guy with the, uh, you know, with this pencil thin mustache. Mm -hmm. He was the Lothario. Yeah. He, you know, he was the bad guy. He was the Indian. Yeah. And in fact, uh, my bio is called "Never Play the Indian" uh, because I started writing a book on that. And I say that in Hollywood, there's only cowboys and Indians, and uh, and never play the Indian. Because, <laughs> because you know, the cowboy always wins. Oh, cowboy right? always wins. Although that's changing. Perhaps you know, the Indian will finally get his due diligence. And think about the Indian, right? The Indian really is the the spirit of the earth. You know, the Indian is the guy that is really connected to to the ecology. Now, the so-called ecological movement right. is to the planet in harmony. Mm -hmm. And and I say we Southern Italians are much more animistic in our sensibility than the North and Northern Europeans. You know, our tradition, though Christian, uh, and specifically Orthodox, before Catholicism, and, and yet again, that was another issue, which is that the South was really part of the Church of Constantinople. Uh, our allegiance, we were Orthodox, in fact, the largest uh, and only Orthodox uh, church uh, on mainland Europe is, is in Calabria, in a place called Stilo. Uh, where there's, um, you know, there's still to this day is a functioning Orthodox monastery that the Pope <coughs> sent, in the Nor sent in the Norman conquerors in the 12th century, which is why we have these big guys, uh, the same guys that conquered England, conquered the south of Italy. And those castles that go from Naples all the way to Sicily that mm -hmm. are within eyesight mm -hmm. are actually Norman castles, Vikings in effect. 800 AD, we had a Viking king. You know, there's the famous Barbarossa. Sicily at one time was the cultural uh, center of Europe. Um, anyway, you know, as you can clearly see, I'm, uh, you know, my hobby is history and, 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 you yeah. know, and all that. I, I want to, you know, get perspective, right? As an so actor. through all of that, what films did you find, or projects did you work on in your career that seemed to encompass more of the idealism that you really run to capture in your films, in your projects? What are some of your favorite shows? Well, you know, very few. I mean, I did, um, I did a film years ago with Gilles Carl, who was a great Quebecois uh, director, called Maria Chavdelaine. And I did a picture called Ticket to Heaven. And I did a picture called Heartbreakers, all three of which are in the National Board of Review in Washington, D.C. as part of, you know, the Smithsonian every, yeah. every um Every year, they choose, yeah, they choose ten films that they put into a, a time vault, uh, and I've got three in there, which is a great honor. None of them made any money, you know, as such. You know, none of them ever, as you know, usual. yeah, as usual. But uh, I would say those three films to an extent, and uh, and the films that I've done, the, the, my own my own personal projects are the ones that you know. Finally, I'm the last few number of years, I'm I'm finally kind of starting to manifest because basically I played the you know like I said the lover I played you know. Uh, you know, mo uh, the, the, the Stingray series, the, the Stingray series, was you know, the, the yeah, yeah, but I mean, Stingray it was sort of like, a, and Steve Cannell, the producer, creator yeah. of that, was Steve a dear Cannell. friend of my, mine, wonderful man, a great soul, 
Um, but the, the, to me, that whole television ethos was everything I despised. I didn't like, I didn't, uh, you know, I loved European films. I loved, uh, you know, Fellini and Kurosawa and Bergman. And, you know, I wanted to do pictures like that. And I ended up, in a sense, in the very middle of sort of like the ethos of the American standard uh, show, right. right? Those movies of the week and those kinds of characters. I mean, not what you would call uh, particularly engaging for me personally. In those, some uh, of your favorite actors that you've worked with? Um, well, I worked with just about everybody. Um, yeah, you worked you're with my favorite actor. <laughs> I just worked with you on, you. Uh, on uh, both Real Gangsters and, uh, and and Big Fat Stone, and you're absolutely wonderful in thank that. Thank you. So are you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, a frank We'll talk game. about that in a few minutes. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I certainly have worked with some of the legends, you know. Charlton in, in Heston. Years. I worked Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren and Catherine Deneuve and Kim Bassinger and uh, just so many. Just what was it like working with Chuck, Chuck Heston? <laughs> He's such a I, phenomenal I actor. love Chuck. I mean, Chuck was just... Uh, I did a picture years ago that uh, called Mother Lode, Mother the Charlton Lode, Heston yeah. um, uh, uh, directed. His son, Fraser Heston, wrote it. And Kim Bassinger and myself were cast in, as, the, as the leads yes. in it. Um, at that time, um, in Hollywood, uh, before, this was before CAA, um, the ICM had a special branch um, called Chase and Park Citroen, and I was brought into the young part of that. And Chase and Park Citroen, and Herman Citroen, and Tom Chasen, and all those guys uh, represented the, the, the biggest stars in Hollywood, from Alfred Hitchcock, Gregory Peck, you know, um, all, yeah, Charlton Heston, all the big names of the 50s and the 60s mm -hmm. were with them, and they brought me in. Uh, along with a few others uh, to be kind of, they were in a sense trying to form CAA. Mm. And, um, and because of that uh, contact, um, Heston uh, met me and then cast me as the lead role in this uh, action adventure picture called Motherload and cast, uh, uh, you know, the yet unknown Kim Bassinger, it was just before she became a huge star. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Chuck, of course, was probably given in my mind the greatest natural dramatic gift going back to Henry Irving. You know, he was, he had the face, he mm -hmm. had the voice, he had the presence, he could have been one of the great, uh, certainly stage actors of a hundred years ago, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 at a time when actors were, you know. You know Noble. Yeah, exactly. And I remember him telling me that in fact, the reason why, one of the reasons he was, he was one of the first global stars, you know, way before Tom Cruise and Travolta and all those guys. He was known around the world. He was huge in Italy and France mm -hmm. and China. Is that according to him, he said that apparently the Chinese regarded him as a star because he, he, he represented the Confucian virtues. And, and Chuck was very much, you know, uh, in a sense, the archetypal American spirit. And uh, and he, um, but he was one of, <laughs> he almost killed me on the show. Um, <coughs> we had, uh, in fact, I did drown uh, while I was shooting Motherload. Uh, it was an incredibly uh, intense, uh, physically intense show. Mm. A lot of running, you know, falling down mountains, mm -hmm. <coughs> hours, uh, days in freezing cold glacier uh, lakes. Uh, plane crashes, you know, so uh, um, I learned how to fly a plane. <clears throat> I learned how to do emergency procedures. I learned underwater, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I had one of my sort of um, epiphanous moments uh, during that shoot. We were north of uh, Vancouver, about 300 miles, beautiful area. You know, and there's some glorious sh sh cinematography in this film uh, done by Richard Leiterman, a great uh, Canadian cinematographer. Uh, and uh, and it was all about uh, you know this guy going out to find uh, this uh, uh, this mine you know this gold. Um, a friend of his, um, my, the, my character's best friend, has disappeared in the in the far north, and his girlfriend Kim uh, Bassinger wants to come with me in search of. So we have to fly the bush plane out way into the boonies where right. we meet this crazed old pro Scottish prospector played by Chuck Heston. Brilliantly, and um, and uh, and he's of course the bad guy, and I'm the hero. And it turns out he had murdered the 
the thing. But um, so uh, you know, the Variety review said the the you know it, it didn't make much of a splash in terms of Hollywood, but but still, what a but, but 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 it did. Uh, the Variety review said you know the extraordinary thing about this film is it didn't kill Nick Mancuso, and in fact it was <laughs> because I I was like it was ultimate kind of stunt stuff, but. So we had a scene where this plane was supposed to land on this glacier lake. Chuck wanted me to uh, fly the plane because <clears throat> he was going to be in another plane shooting with a telephoto lens. You know, this is what happens when you do action adventure, you know. And uh, and I loved it because <laughs> you know, sure. it's, you, well, you know what I it's, it's about. It's playing, yeah. you know. It's it's children games with adult rules. We yeah. had all the toys. <clears throat> and that particular day, uh, a bright, crystal clear, beautiful day. Uh, with no wind, um, uh, Chuck wanted to be in a separate uh, plane, uh, shooting me through a telephoto lens. And in those days, I was into you know all kinds of esoterica. I studied for many years yoga, and astrology, and all kinds of stuff. And I had a friend who was one of um, at that time kind of an Omar of the time in Hollywood, uh, who was an astrologer and really knew his stuff. And he said, "Listen." There are going to be four days here coming up in the next three months where you could actually get killed. And he said, <laughs> don't do any stunts on those days. Well, wouldn't you know it? The day I was supposed to go up on the plane was a big black X on that, don't do stunts. So Chuck came over and said, you know, uh, Nick, so we're going to be putting the camera over there and uh, we want you to. Uh, and I said, I'm not doing it. And <laughs> Chuck said, well, what do you mean you're not doing that? I'm going to get in the camera there and we're going to. And he goes, uh, I said, no, Chuck, I'm, I'm not going up. You're not going to see anything anyway. You're going to shoot through a telephoto. You're going to barely get, you know, you're going to get reflective glare in the glass. And he's like, well, you're right about that. Okay. So uh, he put in the stunt guys. And the plane comes in on an absolutely still crystal day. And, and it starts to make the landing on this uh, still lake. And boom, it hooks somehow. And the whole plane does 360, oh, and, it, and it goes on and on and on for, you know, like the whole film. It's in the film. What a good call by uh, you. Yeah, and, and then sinks. Now, the stunt guys uh, weren't killed, but they were pretty severely injured. Yeah. So because of that, the, the, the shot was such a spectacular shot. Uh, Chuck said, you know, we're going to leave it in the film. So now we're going to have your character, and actually worked better for the film. Uh, and, and that's the nature of filmmaking because the accident becomes part of the, part of the thing, right? Yeah. And that's why you can't plan this stuff, like being in on time, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> you just can't. It's not military time. You know, acting has got to do with the sculpture of time, you know. And, and I mean, Marilyn Monroe was always like, you know, the people I worked with, it's, you don't know where the inspiration is going to come from. Right. And if you try to set it up like some kind of goddamn machine, all you're going to get is robotic little performances of mannequins. We're not mannequins, man. We're, we're actors. It's a, a totally different thing. Anyway, okay. the plane goes down. All right, so let me tell you what. So I have to go and, 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 and then get my gear. I have mountain boots on. I've got a Vietnam flying jacket. I've got sweaters, and I had uh, weight belts and a, and a, a too tight... Um, wetsuit, mm. right, because the water's freezing cold, right. and uh, we're losing the light, and uh, we're on a pier, and, you know, the, the, the pontoons are like this, way out there, and uh, Chuck said, I'll take you out by boat, and I said, no, I'm going to swim, because I was pissed, so I jump into the water, and I start swimming, and uh, and I get to the spot, and I see them, you know, they're about this big, and I, and I jump up into the air, and I go down. And uh, I wait, because, you know, I'm professionals. I want to wait for the surface to clear before I come up. And, um, and I'm waiting, and I open my eyes, and it's black. And I look up, and it's black. And I look down, and it's black. I look to the left, it's black. Right, black. I'm going, holy shit. Where the fuck am I? Mm. So I start kicking with my boots, because I had asked Chuck, should I take them off? He said, no, we might see them. I've got these mountain climbing boots. I've got the sweater and the this and the that. And I start to try to grab the uh, release on the weight belts, right? And as I'm doing that, anyway, um, uh, I drowned. Um, and I'll explain to you how I drowned. All I remember was, um, was um, suddenly I was, um, and I didn't remember this for, for months, I was um, deep. Uh, 
uh, I could, you know, I, I was gasping, you know, I, I, I knew I was dying. And I, the thing that was really pissing me off was the fact that I was dying in a B movie. And I thought, fuck. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I don't mind dying in an A movie, but I mean, a B movie? Uh, was uh, I went down this tunnel and um, uh, I heard the universal om. I, you, by the way, when you die, you, um, you relive your life backwards at great speed. I know because I experienced it. It's like a tape. And every sound, every noise, every gesture you've ever made is repeated. In fact, your whole body goes through it. That's what I experienced. I went down this white tunnel. Um, I got to the end of the tunnel and there was this glorious light and this amazing love. Uh, and the spirit said to me, uh, God, I guess, said, uh, it's not your time. And put something into my chest and pushed me and the next thing I know, I was on the surface of the water like this. I could see them jumping up and down, trying to get into boats, panicked because I disappeared. And my hand went up and grabbed uh, the pontoon. And I held with two fingers like this. And they came, got me, put me on the boat, got me back to the pier. Chuck was there, you know, big, imposing man. They, they just flopped me on the pier. I was lying there. And Chuck comes up and goes, you OK? All right, let's move camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! That was Charlton Heston. Oh my God! Yeah. Rest his soul. Uh, Nick, we're just going to start talking about some of the films that you've been working on lately. Two films in particular. Yeah. Uh, Real Gangsters and The Big Fat Stone, yeah. both produced, directed, written, written scored by and acted by Frank D'Angelo, which Frank is an extraordinary, extraordinary human being. Yeah. It's Can you talk a little bit about these projects? Yeah. Now, uh, Real Gangsters is, is uh, worldwide. Uh, you can download it uh, on uh, on Netflix and Rogers On Demand, and apparently it's everywhere. It's in Russia. And Nick, what makes it Real Gangsters as opposed to what other gangsters are out there? <laughs> well, of the course, there is Unreal Gangsters, and that, that'll be a sequel. Right. <laughs> um, um, the title, you know, it's interesting because Frank, I had done a show, the Being Frank show. I was on the show to uh, plug a, a film I'd done called The Resurrection of Tony Gittoni. And afterwards, uh, Frank uh, took me and the director out uh, for dinner at his restaurant, uh, the uh, Forget About It restaurant uh, on King Street. You can all right. go there. And, uh, and he said, you know, I want to make a movie. And uh, the director, uh, I won't name, said, um, he said, great, great, well, sure, all right, in about a year or so, and he said, no, I want to do it like uh, in a month, three weeks or something. And we both look at him, looked at him like he's out of his mind. And, and the director, you know, 40 years of experience went, well, good luck. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we left and then Frank calls me up and he says, you know, um, I want to do a series, uh, a television show, uh, and I want to do it, uh, I want to start immediately and uh, come and have uh, dinner with me. And he starts talking this story that became Real Gangsters, just talked it out. Right. And I said, okay. Um, and I called up this uh, screenwriter friend of mine in Hollywood, uh, Phil Morton, and Frank got on the phone to him and basically talked out the whole film in about three, four days. Dialogue, the whole bit. I mean, extraordinary mind. Uh, and then I thought, well, who can be in it? And I called up, uh, you know, uh, uh, yourself, but, uh, you know, Michael Pere and John Savage and Robert Marjardi and uh, Margot Kidder and and, uh, uh, and then we got Robert Loggia and all these extraordinary actors and they all kind of went yeah this sounds let's uh, try it so we uh, we shot the thing uh, in five days six cameras six and cameras six cameras and uh, how unheard of is that uh, first time in forty two years of doing film I ever heard of anything like that. Uh, and, and Art Hindle, who's also a Canadian actor, a wonderful actor, has been around for a while, basically said, you know, Frank has created a new kind of uh, model, a new paradigm, because of course now with the new technology of camera and everything else and internet and all that, it is now possible to actually do that. And, and Frank did it. Plus, he wrote all the music, he starred in it, uh, you know, it, it was amazing. And I thought, is this going to work? And lo and behold, I was like staggered. It worked. I mean, it's not everybody's cup of tea, obviously. It's a, it's a gangster picture. Basically, it's a soap opera for gangsters. Right. And it's character driven. You know, Sean McCann's in it, and uh, just a wonderful uh, Geza Kovacs. Uh, Sean McCann. Yeah, yeah, just lovely. Uh, both Canadian and American, really, uh, you know, superb actors. Yeah. And uh, as you know, actors can read a phone book and make it interesting. And um, 
uh, a combination of that and everything else. And, you know, we actually have, a, I think, a piece of, of entertainment, um, you know, dealing with uh, that milieu. And it's, it's a gangster movie. Did you? That's, uh, it looks like a beautiful film. It is. Movie. It is, and uh, it's it's won awards. Actually, uh, it's won four or five uh, best picture awards uh, through, throughout the United States and really? Canada. Yeah, and then he said he wanted to do this other thing called Big Fat Stone. Same deal. Yeah. Only in Big Fat Stone, uh, he kind of basically threw away the script, and we, as you know, we got yeah. on the set, and he starts feeding us lines. Yeah. And I was going as we're day. shooting. Yeah, as we're shooting, and and you know the actors are going, "What are we doing?" And then we had the screening the other day, and it's like, wow. I loved it. <laughs> it works. Yeah. How does it happen? I don't know. I mean, you know, I think that uh, there are some people that just are born to do this. Frank is one of them. He's also a musician, as you know. And hold on a sec. Let me try to get he's this. absolutely yeah. stunningly brilliant. He is, yeah. He's, he's an example, I think, of... Of uh, you know, I, look, I don't want to use the word genius, but but uh, there is yeah, a kind of a there is a kind of genius involved in this. Yeah, very much. You know, and uh, and the spirit of of um, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, and that's the other thing too about movies and and art or poetry or, or painting or or anything anything that is to do with the arts. You can't you can't. Uh, you can't legislate it. You can't governmentalize it. You can't put it in little packets and decide, you know, because you don't know where the inspiration is going to come from. So you have to create, and especially in Canada, which, you know, is, a, I think, a horrendous system for, uh, for artists, you know, where 2% of the money goes to the actors and 2% goes to the writers. It, it's, it, you cannot legislate. You can't use military time. You know, the, the old Hollywood was done by the artists. Hollywood was created by artists. Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, uh, you know, the Barrymores, uh, United Artists, all that stuff. And, and what the studio guys did in those days is they had respect for artists and they created a, a system whereby it was possible for people to kind of really kind of create. Now you're creating yeah. your own project. I'm doing my own, yeah. I'm working on a picture called uh, Greg, uh, Corso on the life of the... Uh, uh, Calabrian American poet Gregory Corso, one of the founders of the Beats, along with Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg. He fascinates me. Bill Burroughs. Uh, Bill Burroughs and the, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh, uh, really, and I shot part of that in Italy. We've been shooting it and we're trying to get the rest of the budget. It's the same old story. I worked on a musical called uh, The Great Googlehof. Which, yeah, how's uh, that coming? Well, you know, we lost our investor and. Uh, but we have four songs in, in and, and I recorded some of it. Hopefully we'll get back to it. But the one I'm working on now is a, is a picture, <clears throat> excuse me, is a picture called Born Dead. And I've been working on it for about a month, uh, almost two months actually, on and off. Uh, and it, it, in this, it's sort of reality within reality, which is what interests me. Uh, I play myself, Nick Mancuso, and uh, as an actor who with the whole sort of history of 42 years of acting, which I've, I've done it now for 42 years, who basically has come to the end of his road, you know, and, and he decides he's going to jump off a bridge. And, uh, and he starts taking this journey along Blur Street on the way to the Danforth Bridge and begins to encounter both real and character and acting and all kinds of people on this gauntlet to, to, his, to his death. So well, you can see, you can see in that it's kind of Fellini-esque. Yeah, very piece, much so. You yeah. know, and it's hallucinogenic, and basically we go into the mind of a guy who is hallucinating his own life. Mm. He has become an hallucinated figure, a character in his own existence. I figure, you know, most of the time you play characters. What well, you know, it's one thing to be playing Vershinen or Lobachin or or I don't want to use the Scottish play Hamlet or whatever, where you actually have characters or Oedipus Rex or any of those kinds of things, where the distance between from you to the character can be sometimes immense. But nowadays we're in an age where Bob plays Bill and Bill plays Bob. It's like, where are the characters? Where, where's the characterization gone? Yeah. You know, it's all homogenized stuff. You know, when Stanislavski and, and all those guys, there, there were types. And these types are characters or archetypes. Right? Well, these archetypes have all disappeared. And, uh, you know, and they've been taken over basically by cartoons and animation, you know. Mm -hmm. The best acting that's going on is that, that troll, you know, in um, Harry Potter. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So it's like the art of acting where we actually got to play, you know, in the old days, an actor my age, like, like uh, Irving at that time or Keane, would, would have played Hamlet and did play Hamlet at, 60, at 65. Played Romeo. 
you know, at 65. Um, that's impossible now. Basically, you 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 play yourself. Yeah. You know, you're you're you're, you're not yeah. acting. You're reacting. Now you're bringing a whole new sense of acting in your own curriculum. You develop. You're developing a, a right, curriculum I, for I, actors. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm also right, yes. I'm also going to start teaching a course. I wrote a book called uh, Acting for Everyone, uh, and I developed over the 47 years a system called the Top System. I would love for you to come and and be part of these exercises. Right, Basically. Okay. You know, my background, even though I'm a crazy and stupid actor, uh, is actually, I was going to be a research psychologist, and, uh, and I was quite serious about it. Uh, my, my love was science, physics, and, and math, and, and those things, and then acting just sort of came, was something I did for kicks all through high school and university. Got an offer to the National Theatre School, turned it down, I don't want to be an actor. I, I was really wanted to do it, so I applied, in a sense, my analytic and scientific background to the art, science, and craft of acting. And from that I developed something called the top system. Not because it's the top, it just happens to work out that way because it, is, it refers to three basic ideas, uh, tension or tensegrity, object or inner object, and persona. So it ends up being this, this, the symbol of it is this triangle with a circle. And it is a kind of, and I, uh, uh, and I applied it, I've been teaching it on and off for about 25 years. Um, I started doing it when I was doing Stingray because uh, I was working with really good uh, Canadian, uh, mostly American actors, but the Canadian actors were brought in. And I couldn't figure out why they sucked. And, uh, and they did. And they were good actors on stage. I'd worked with them. And I'm going like, why do they suck? What's going on? And then I began to realize that they were working in a different medium than, than, than television. In other words, it's like one was a sculptor and the other is a painter. They were confusing what the medium was. And so I, that's how the course was developed. I originally developed it for stage actors to make them understand how camera works. The camera is a very different medium. At the turn of the century, 98% of the actors working today couldn't possibly be actors. Why? Because the only way you could be an actor in 1880 was to have a voice. As Tommaso Salvini, the great Italian actor, said to Stanislavski, the guy that gave Stanislavski the whole understanding of what then became the so-called method. But when Tommaso Salvini himself was asked what is acting, he said, voce, 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 voice, voice, voice. All information was transmitted by the human voice. And actors at that time were barrel-chested, kind of like opera singers. Mm -hmm. you know, they're in 12 millimeter wow. lens. Centers. Right. Then this huge revolution brought about by Edison, Tesla, and the beginning of Melies and the beginning of film, and suddenly you had a switch and you're into a whole new medium. As the medium, as Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message, began to transform, the nature of what and who could be an actor began to change until we are now in an age where so-called reality, reality TV, TV, where anybody's anybody an actor, anybody, act. anybody supposedly can act. Well, of course, that's not the art of acting. No. But so I developed a system to make people um, understand, not just actors, what uh, uh, you know, specifically film acting is and who the great film actors are and why. Why is Brando a great actor? Why is Marilyn Monroe a great film actor? Why is James Dean a great film actor? You know, icons. What is it about them as opposed to very good actors that are very eminently forgettable? Um, you know, I've seen great stage actors on Broadway that did not transform, translate, translate. into film. So I developed a system, and I, I'm uh, hoping to teach it on the internet, and I'm also teaching it uh, here in Toronto, and um, uh, and uh, and I, I've written a book about it, uh, about half a book. I'm going to finish it, but it fascinates me. It interests me. I mean, I've always been curious. You know? Well, I wish you a great deal of luck in the book, and the curriculum, and the rest of your career. You're thank absolutely you, stunningly brilliant. Th thank you. It's Tom. been an absolute pleasure talking to you, thank you. listening to you. I look forward to seeing real gas, real gangsters really take off. And that the big fat great. stone looked like a beautiful picture. We both saw it the other night. Yeah. And we're very pleased with the project. I'm, I'm hoping we will work together. And I want to thank you for letting me appear on your show, on your first show. Thank you. And it's an honor for me. Thank you. And thanks, Tony. It's a pleasure. All right. Nick Mancuso, everybody. Nick Mancuso. Thank you. thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. And good night, ladies good and gentlemen. Good night.